within the next, I would say, 30 minutes or so, we would like to give you some insights into what did we think, how did we develop the serious game, and uh, what is the background of that. And then we have a little let's play video. So we would like you to, we would like to show you exactly what you can do with the game and how it works when you sit in front of your computer. And after that, uh, we will have a little Q&A session. So uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate, ask them to us. You can also put them in the chat if you want, and then we will try to answer all your questions. So if I'm speaking about we, uh, this is uh, Tobias Schumacher and myself. So I'm Marian Festing, and I'm a professor of human resource management and intercultural leadership at ESCP Business School. School, uh, working in our excellent Center for Intercultural Management. Uh, and uh, as you will see, uh, the serious game is also sponsored by Renault. So I was the academic director of the Renault Chair of Intercultural Management. And in addition to that, we combine everything and have a talent management institute where we, of course, also speak about intercultural talent. So, but it's not only me today, but you see another picture here. and. I I would like to ask Tobias to present himself. Yes, so a warm welcome from my side as well. Um, as Marian already said, my name is Tobias and I'm a research assistant and PhD student at the Chair of Human Resource Management and Intercultural Leadership. And uh, in my PhD thesis, I primarily take a closer look at how learning is working with serious games. So really trying to understand what is the learning process unfolding when using serious games, but also uh, then take a closer look at, well, does it actually work? Do people actually learn when playing a serious game? So it's very interesting uh, from a research side, but also uh, I'm very grateful that we uh, both got the opportunity to develop the serious game in the first place. It's uh, been quite an extensive project. Um, and that we that we had uh, to do or were able to do um, with my um, investing, obviously, and also like a game development agency and some other external uh, people who supported us. So it's really been a great pleasure to develop that and also to uh, introduce you to the game and some aspects of it uh, today. Um, and so let's start right away with the presentation and maybe before talking specifically about the serious game. Um, I want to give you some background information, an overview of what is happening, what, what are current trends that we can observe in the field of education and learning. And one trend that uh, has increased in pace, I would say, during Corona, but was also very much prevalent and visible uh, before that is the trend of digitalization, obviously not only uh, in, the, in the field of learning and education, but also there. And there we can see that basically digital and mobile content delivery um, is, is getting more um, uh, attraction and people on one side, the learners demand this kind of learning technologies to learn with that. Um, and uh, also when we think about the way how technology um, evolved throughout the last uh, decades, let's say, uh, we can see that immersive technologies become more and more uh, important, not only uh, technologies like computer games, video games, which as we will discuss later on, also very much rely on immersion, but also thinking about um, virtual reality or augmented reality applications, for instance, which you might call at this point in time, still very much in its infancy, not uh, reaching its maturity level yet, but we can see clear trends that this technology is going to um, develop even further. Um, and another major trend obviously also related to digitalization is artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence is also very much used to uh, improve the educational experience by really trying to understand what it is that the actual that the learner actually needs, uh, thereby supporting um, the learning process, and that is also somewhat related to the second trend that we can observe, which is uh, personalization. So um, I, I think some of you might have heard or are familiar with concepts such as flipped classroom um, and and similar approaches, where really the focus is much less is increasingly much less on the 
uh, content oriented deployment of contents, but rather really tries to focus on the learner thinking or trying to sort of uh, improve the learning experience by personalizing and uh, concentrating them on the learner. And also that's like the demand side of learning. Learners want to have easy access and flexibility. Learners really increasingly want to be able to design their own learning. And in addition to that, there is also another uh, major trend, which is not necessarily uh, uh, quite a recent trend, but a trend that we can observe throughout the last decades. Um, on the next slide, and uh, we have uh, done some calculations and some, num some numbers and statistics that we want to uh, provide you to uh, provide you with. And um, if you look at the average person of age 25, this is uh, data from Germany, and but I'm pretty sure that this applies similarly to other countries as well. The average person of age 25 has played 10,123 hours of video games. And that includes people um, who have not played games at all and those who, who include who play a lot of video games. So it really is like uh, the average person has played quite substantially. And uh, comparing that to uh, a bachelor's and master's degree, um, which uh, takes 9,000 hours in total to complete, we can basically say that we have a lot of, like the average person of age 25 has a complete master's degree in, in video gaming. And uh, the trend is in, in that sense, uh, even growing that also older um, generations are increasingly getting access to, um, to video games. So we can really see that this is a trend that proliferates like every, like every single, single section of society as well. And so, why not use that also uh, for the purpose of learning and education? Um, and so that was like basically the main starting point. And Marian will now tell you a little bit more about how we made use of that data and designed the series game. Yeah, thank you very much, Tobias. And uh, well, you may think, well, how did you come to the idea of developing a serious game on intercultural management? Well. First, uh, we have this learning objective, right? We want to develop intercultural competence and uh, we want to uh, conceptualize that with cultural intelligence, which is really the most well-known concept to measure intercultural competence. And why did we do that at ESCP? Well, you may know that ESCP has six campuses across Europe and that you cannot only study at one location. So this means that intercultural competence, of course, is in the DNA of ESCP, right? And uh, so we said, well, we should be very innovative in teaching intercultural management, right? And uh, so this took us on a journey and we started in 2016 developing this or the ideas, the basic ideas for this uh, game on intercultural management. And for that, we studied uh, what is new in intercultural research, because you may know that, right? So people tend to simplify when speaking about intercultural management. So the Germans are like this, the Japanese are very collective, the Scandinavians are very individualistic, but there's much more to that. And especially during the last 10 years, intercultural management research really has developed a lot with a lot of fascinating concepts. And we studied all of them and put all of that into the game. So it's based on the latest research in intercultural management. And uh, in addition to that, we also looked at, well, how do people learn, right? And I mean, we are an academic institution. So we looked at that from experiential learning theory, which explains us that there are two ways of learning. One is, uh, let's say, cultural exposure. So we learn when we are traveling, when we are uh, going abroad for studying, when we go on an expatriate assignment. But do we also make sense out of that? Not always. We need to reflect what we see, what we learn, and we need to think how we can adjust our behavior to that, right? And so, uh, just having international experience, we thought, is not enough, but we want to leverage that. So how can we leverage that? Well, normally you have formal instruction, right? You get all of these concepts uh, in a classroom, we have classroom training, and uh, also here you learn some 
something. But obviously, uh, you have advantages which are associated to international exposure, and you have advantages uh, which are associated with classroom training. But we wanted to put both together because then we have a higher learning effect, right? So we said we apply this with a serious game in order to develop culture intelligence. Now, how did that work, right? Uh, we were not specialists in serious game design, so we had to look at the game mechanics and uh, had to decide what are we going to do. And therefore, we looked at design science and uh, found out where, what is important here. And we saw that the usability is very important. What does it mean, usability? Usability means that you enjoy playing the game, that it keeps your intention, that you immerse in the story. And again, this has an impact on reaching the goal of culture intelligence development. The other criterion here is usefulness. So we really have to prove that our game in possibly a blended learning setting, right, as we do it at ESCP, uh, helps us to reach the goal of developing intercultural competence. And uh, there are a lot of single decisions which you need to take on the way to developing such a serious game. And this involves storytelling, this involves the characters, and here on the right side, you see Lucy, right? And uh, we are at the beginning, we had a discussion, how should Lucy look like, right? And then we decided for the blue hair, because uh, this makes her a little bit independent from, let's say, the notions of a white person or an Asian person or a person of color, right? So a lot of decisions had to be taken on the storyline, on the correct characters, on the speakers, on the whole scenery. And Tobias will now introduce you a little bit to the storyline that we have developed. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to tell you everything about the story because that would spoil some uh, interesting uh, story events. But um, at the start, you basically in an episode, so the game overall, this is like we have basically two different games. And now I'm going to focus on moving tomorrow one an intercultural journey, which has six episodes in total. And we will talk a little bit about the second part of the game uh, in a minute as well. But here really you start playing Lucy uh, that Marion already introduced and uh, Lucy, like the setting basically is that she has just moved to Berlin with her boyfriend to start working for this new company. And this new company is called Runnergy. And Runnergy is really sort of envisioned as the beacon of sustainable entrepreneurship. So we really try to think about a company uh, in the future that is uh, very progressive, that takes sustainability very seriously. And also simultaneously that is organized very much um, according to uh, some trends that we can uh, currently observe in the working world. Um, uh, such as Holacracy, which is an organizational structure that is pretty much um, characterized by flat hierarchies, by a lot of autonomy from the employees who, where employees really are put in charge to design their own work, to come up with their own projects, thereby helping the company. And we really wanted to mimic that in the game as well, so that we um, have a company that also um, sort of shows a little bit the pathway about how the future of work could be organized. And in these two episodes, really a lot has to do um, with sort of on one side, getting to know the company, getting to know your new co-workers, but also then passing the trial period, which is um, something where you have to sort of uh, solve some tasks and prove your skills um, to your fellow uh, co-workers so that you can uh, keep on working for the company. And this is really taking place in, in Berlin and where the headquarters of uh, Ranaji are located. And then in episode three and four, you um, are doing expatriate assignments. Episode three takes you to Russia where you get to know the Russian subsidiary of Ranaji. And episode four is taking you to China where you get to know the Chinese subsidiary. And here's something that we wanted to um, be, be able the students, the students to experience is that um, really multinational companies operating in different countries are influenced on one side by the 
culture of the headquarters, right? So they have an impact on how the subsidiaries in other countries are organized, but also, also the national, the local cultural context in which the subsidiary is located has an influence. And this experience going to the different locations really allows to experience that, right? Like this sort of by uh, uh, two influences that can sort of influence how a company is operating. And uh, obviously we have like some uh, conspiracy uh, going on in Ranaji and you will find out that maybe not everything is as good as it seems in the company. Um, but uh, for finding out more about that, you would have to uh, play the game yourselves. And so that's like pretty much the storyline. And I'm now um, going to talk uh, about uh, the contents that we integrated. And here we try to really, and that was a very conscious decision. We try to focus at first on the lower levels of, of culture because culture is something very complex. You can talk about national culture, group culture, organizational culture. And we really tried here to start with the individual, with the smaller groups, with the organization to um, really make the students acquainted with how can you conceptualize and understand that. And then afterwards we move on with introducing concepts of national culture, um, concepts of cultural diversity and cultural dynamics. So really that when we talk about national culture and Marion hinted already um, towards that, that we are able to equip the students with the necessary reflective skills to um, be able to also account for diversity, right? Because not everybody in, in German is a very typical German culture, right? And then in episode six, we have um, a repetition and the students have to go all, all over the insights and uh, we are going to get to know what these insights are about and how we integrated the learning material when, you, when we show you the let's play video um, of our game. And um, then in the second part uh, of the game, moving tomorrow too, um, it's really about applying the knowledge from the first um, game. So the first game is really uh, integrating and depicting the status quo of international management research and really trying to deploy the foundations that are important to understand when talking about intercultural management. And then in the second part, we have um, focus more on, well, okay, so what does it mean for teamwork? What does it mean for leadership and sort of applying these concepts? And uh, Marion will now uh, present some of the concepts that we introduced and also a little bit of the thinking behind introducing them. Yeah, thank you very much, Tobias. And uh, what did we want to achieve, right? We wanted to achieve uh, that we reach several learning goals. We wanted to reach a cognitive learning goals so people should know about the different concepts. We also wanted to reach effective learning goals, which means the motivation to learn something. And we also wanted to have an effect on behavior because this is what you need in an intercultural uh, scenery. So people need to be competent when uh, dealing with different cultures, right? And uh, for this, we we're thinking, well, how can we do a very realistic training, right? That uh, targets to the cognitive, the effective and the behavioral level. And for those of you who know little, who are a bit acquainted, right? With uh, intercultural management research, you probably know the names of Hofstede, of GLOBE. So these are the big intercultural management studies which uh, describe countries, right? They would say, well, uh, for example, the power distance in France is higher than in Germany, or as I said before, the individualism uh, in uh, Scandinavia is higher than in Japan. But this is on a very, very aggregate level. And uh, it can lead to stereotyping, to very simplified stereotyping. And this is why we said, well, we need more here. What is out there? And so we looked at value archetypes and these value archetypes are a bit more uh, of a differentiation of these first studies because they would show that, for example, a certain group of people like our students, right? The young international students might be much more similar to each other than let's say uh, these group of 
students in Germany and, for example, an older generation in Germany, which has not spent so much time abroad, right? So you have similarities between groups, between countries, like international students in Germany and France and Italy, right? Uh, and you do not have so many similarities within the country. So this is something we took up uh, in the serious game. And then we also looked at norms, for example. So what you should do, for example, injunctive norms would mean that you have to display a certain behavior and you get a reaction uh, to that, right? Is it good or is it bad? And this is also very typical for different uh, countries to be different here, right? And uh, yeah, we have a lot of other uh, frameworks which we included, maybe the last one, polyculturalism shows that, for example, you as a person, you are not only German, right? We would not only look at German values, but you're also influenced by uh, your context. So, for example, you may do yoga, you may uh, have a family background, you may be a mother, you may have studied in another country. All of this influences yourself. And with integrating all of these uh, concepts of intercultural management, we wanted to draw a more differentiated picture of culture. And as Tobias just said, it starts really on the personal level, it goes on with the group level, organizational level, and in addition to that, we have the national level, right? So this is our idea of avoiding simplified stereotyping in intercultural management. So what do the students think about that? right? Uh, and uh, we are very proud to say this, that the students like very much playing the game. And uh, my favorite quote is always uh, that uh, on Monday morning, I get an email from a student who said, I can't come because I'm sick. So is there any way to still finish the game, right? So there was a very strong interest in playing the game and in seeing how the story pans out, right? Uh, and uh, we did not only uh, uh, use the game with our master students, but we also used that in an executive setting. And here the reaction was, well, you know, all the trainings, they are based on PowerPoint. And with the serious game, we have a different way of learning because we might forget one or the other PowerPoint slide, but we may not forget uh, the adventures which Lucy had, for example, for example, when going to Russia, right? Uh, so uh, they really appreciated this different way of learning through uh, our serious game, right? And uh, yeah, of course we are at an academic institution and therefore we did some research on how effective really is the serious game. And uh, Tobias will tell you a little bit about the research results that we found. Yeah, and so that was quite encouraging uh, also because obviously on one side we wanted to create or to more make uh, learning and education a little bit more entertaining, right, and to increase the fun of learning, which we thought was important, but then also we, we figured that this is not necessarily enough. A game should be able to do more than only being fun. And so we took a closer look at cultural intelligence and Marion already introduced that construct that's really uh, measuring intercultural competence. It's quite a well-researched construct. And what we found is that um, the students and people who play the game really develop their cognitive and metacognitive um, cultural intelligence. So really like they acquired more knowledge, obviously, but they also improved their reflection skills and their, their, ability, their ability to think about thinking, right? That's the metacognitive part. And this is quite, commonly found in academic uh, education. That's really um, a result that you, you find uh, or that you could also reach when having a normal formal instruction of intercultural management. But then, and this is something that is really like the crucial difference and that's really interesting, that we could also observe behavioral development, that by playing the game, by immersing into the game and also observing how the characters reacted within the game, the students were able to develop their behavioral competence. And this is something that is 
very, very difficult to do in academic education, where usually behavior is not that, um, not that uh, much addressed. And also something that is important to mention is that it didn't matter whether or not the people who played the game were experienced gamers, did not have any experience playing games at all. Um, we have, as, as Marlon said, a very international student body. So even though these um, individuals usually already have a lot of intercultural experience, they were still able to develop their cultural intelligence. And uh, also gender did not play a role. So it didn't matter whether or not you're a female or a male, um, both uh, groups um, benefited similarly. And um, what we also found that is very interesting because thinking about like these two different pathways that Marian also described, cultural exposure on one side and then on the other side, formal instruction, um, a serious game really allows to combine both of these worlds and to merge them, right? Because you can still have a very much structured learning experience because a game, if you think about it from a pedagogical perspective, you can really design it in a way as to maximize the learning and guide the learners in their learning experience. But then at the same time, you also allow students to have virtual real life like experiences, right? They immerse in the story and this really helps to sort of address different learning styles as well, because there are some people who just simply learn better when they are confronted with theories, ideas, more abstract knowledge, sort of thinking about that, a lot of log logical reasoning is involved. And then there are the people who tend to favor uh, immediate experience much more and really like to get into new situations, apply their knowledge, interact with others. And both of these aspects can be addressed in a serious game, which I think is, or which we think is quite encouraging um, also with regard to the potential. And then uh, the third research inside, we found that uh, immersion and flow are really important um, mediators that help to uh, help the students to learn. So by immersing into the environment and really becoming a part of the game, uh, identifying quite strongly with the main character of the game, students are able um, to learn. And this in turn generates or can generate uh, um, high levels of enjoyment and attention in the literature with regard to serious games in general is somewhat ambiguous. Some games really are able to um, provoke that uh, in students. Some uh, serious games are not necessarily that strong in regards to that. So we are really happy uh, that uh, the uh, flow uh, experience that we were investigating was really there and helped students um, to learn and thereby also creating a new uh, learning atmosphere. And so um, these are the research insights and uh, thank you very much uh, from our side. So this is like the presentation part. Uh, shortly we will show you the video, the let's play video and something that is also very important sort of as a message um, that uh, we hope with the serious game but also with our work that we can contribute to uh, making uh, the world of work but not only that uh, more inclusive, which given the current trends that we can observe um, is, is highly relevant. And so, um, yeah, we are now showing you the video and we have also put a link on the slide. So in case you're interested in playing the game, you can also share the link uh, in the chat so that you can just copy and paste it and uh, go on our website and sort of find out uh, more about the game. Or if you are interested in playing, just uh, contact us and uh, we'll uh, arrange that. Um, so, but now let's take a closer look at the game itself. We talked a lot about it. And so now I think it's time um, to show what is happening. And let me share the screen yeah. with you. And if you should have any questions after the little film, we will have time for Q&A, right? Okay. All right. So I hope you're ready. Um, here with here we start with Lucy, and um, she's just uh, woken up and about to start her first day at a new company. And we take a quick look at how we can navigate through the world. So here we see it's just like the tutorial and we click a little bit on the objects that you can see here in the room to sort of get familiarized to the navigation. And we're still 
in the flat. But I can't sleep for that is Philip, Lucy's boyfriend. That's Philip. My boyfriend. And both of them, Obviously Lucy the and Philip, one. just moved to Berlin to, because Lucy has just started a new job a at a company called Runergy, of which we are going to get a little bit more information later on as well. Okay, Lucy, let's hit the waterfall. So, and here basically you see a screen where you can see different choices that you can make about Lucy's past, which is sort of the basic ideas that you um, decide a little bit for yourself about how the character has been developing previously. It's thinking a little bit about your own preferences, uh, what you would like her to have been done in the past. And you're basically clicking yourself through that um, as well. And then we are almost ready to start working and to start our first day at the new company. And this is basically the second scene and here we see Lucy talking to Tom. Uh, Tom is the guy that is to the left with a gray suit and uh, he's working for energy for quite some time now and then on the other side to the right of Lucy we have Jim who also has just started working for Ranaji. And here we get a little bit more background about the company Ranaji itself. And Tom is telling us about the unique structure that Ranaji is having, um, which we can also see on the little Bible that Tom just described as that. It's like the handbook of the company where the structure of the company gets introduced. Um, and also a little bit more uh, about the background. So Ranaji basically is a company that is um, very famous for its commitment to sustainable entrepreneurship. So it's really focusing a lot on the sustainability aspect of, of business and really trying to portray a very progressive, a very future-oriented perspective of a company. And um, that's something that Lucy is, has experience, is experiencing right now and uh, getting to know about. Yeah, so cool. I like these modern organizational structures. Don't you think so, Lucy? Oh, yes, um, me too. And here we have a like, first question where we have to apply some knowledge that we have just gathered from reading the handbook. And here we have to decide holacracy. what kind of structure yes. Ranaji is we built upon. And it's holacracy, basically a focus on self-organization, flat hierarchies. And again, something where we try to mirror very um, like the trends existing currently uh, that we can observe in the in the business world uh, about how work is organized. Small project in one of our locations abroad. And we also get to know that we have to convince the council members of our suitability to work for Ranergy as Lucy. So we have to prove a little bit our uh, professionalism and our skills in the beginning, similar to like a classical testing period that you usually have in, in companies. Just ask and I'll help you as best as I can. I uh, have a question. Is it actually true that you are the inventor? Of and we also get to know that Tom, the guy on the left, uh, also was head of the project for a very important product that the company introduced, E-Steps, which are basically shoes that you can put on and that produce energy while you have them on. And while you're walking, so again, sort of um, signifying the, the sustainable aspect or focus of the company um, once again. So we got together, exchanged ideas, and it's been quite a ride. Anyway, I think that's all you need to know for now. And we also find out that Jim, the guy who also started working with us, might not necessarily be the nicest one. Um, he's sort of attacking Lucy in that conversation, calling her a cat or saying that her cat has the same name as Lucy and also not really interesting in, in socializing and getting to know her. So maybe not necessarily the nicest co-worker that you can imagine. Netpresso 9000 activated. Brewing, brewing. Coffee is ready. Okay, this scene is taken from episode two. So the game overall has six episodes, each episode taking approximately one hour to complete. And this is the beginning of the second episode. And Lucy is talking to Philip about her experiences um, working for Ranergy, her experiences starting working there and her first day. 
and uh, she's also talking about the new product that Ranaji is going to introduce. But Philip somehow is a little bit more skeptical because from the past she, he knows that Lucy really can get a little bit workaholic from time to time and uh, spend a lot of time working and he is not really that pleased about that because uh, he is more focused on building the relationship and spending time with her and uh, she, she also likes spending time with him obviously but uh, work is also very important for her so we see some sort of uh, conflict between the two. That you didn't forget our little deal? Hey, of course. And for example here Philip asks Lucy whether she can promise him to not work that much this time and here the player can really decide what he or she wants to uh, wants Lucy to react. So you can promise Philip to not work as much um, what we do, what we did here, or you uh, can so not promise him, which in turn will affect how he is reacting to her. So obviously when she promises him to not work as much, he's very happy about it. And uh, if she doesn't do that, he is a little bit more upset and doesn't really like that. And we have like an argument, a conflict developing. Um, which we're going to see later on how this is going to unfold. But these are like the type of decisions that you're usually making in the game, where it's really about having two different options and deliberating a little bit about what the better option would be for you personally. And here we see the learning interface. So basically, that's, that's a very important aspect of the game, because uh, right now we have a little bit focused on the gaming aspect and how it's played. So usually you just click through the game with a left mouse click. So it's, it's rather straightforward. Um, but you also have to learn, obviously, that, that makes the game serious. And here we have an introduction to norms as an example um, for, for an insight that you unlock. And here you can see when you read through it, you have on one side basically the definitions, which is printed in bold here in the insight. Um, that's academic definitions about how norms are uh, conceptualized and defined. And then also you have that related to the, um, learn to the, the, the situation that you just experienced where you had like this little argument between Lucy and Philip and uh, Philip bringing up the, the promise that Lucy made that she won't work that much. And that really exemplifies norms um, in a way. So here we have seen uh, a norm between that was agreed upon between Lucy and Philip. And now uh, with our promise or the lack of the promise that we gave, we can sort of change and adapt the norms in our relationship. And really, this is an example of how we try to sort of merge the practical application with theoretical knowledge and insights and so to, to have a more concrete idea of what it's actually that the students learn when playing the game. Alexander and here we are basically in the fourth episode um, and Lucy has just returned from Russia where she uh, has started her project that she has to work on and in Russia there's a subsidiary of Ranaji um, which is headquartered in Berlin and now she tells Ryan a little bit about uh, her experiences um, with Alexandra, which is the director of the Russian subsidiary. And Ryan also had made some experiences with her. Um, and he's describing a situation where he was talking back to her in a project because he thought that the idea wasn't as good or that he had a better idea for a project. But Alexandra wasn't really that pleased about it. And here you can also see how we sort of try to depict the cultural differences existing between countries where on one side you had the headquarters in Ranaj in Berlin which are very um, which are very much organized like a holacracy with flat hierarchies and um, uh, a lot of responsibility on the individual to find uh, work and or to find projects to work on and in Russia it's still very different because in Russia you usually have a larger degree of power distance that's the insight that is unlocked also in Russia which uh, implies that uh, management is more centralized and um, employees usually on average that's important to mention um, have uh, lower freedom or autonomy than uh, is the case in, in Germany for instance and here we also have to reflect a little bit about it and re apply the knowledge also again in a conversation with Ryan um, where we have to demonstrate that um, power distance that, that we understood the concept of power distance. 
And here we are basically in the relaxation area of, of Runnergy, of the company. So it's a little bit uh, like a park meets office space uh, where you can relax and also get some drinks and explore the company a little bit more. And here we encounter Jim again. If you remember, that was the colleague that also started working with you, who seemed a little bit arrogant, pretentious. But here, apparently, he has some news to tell Lucy about the company. And maybe, after all, not everything seems or not everything is as good and sustainable at Ranaji as it seemed in the first few episodes. So. Not sure what actually is behind that, but there seems to be something going on inside the company.